Hello everyone and thank you for come along, uh, coming along to my seminar on peopling the Americas, new insights from ancient Pooh. So just a bit of background then. Um, I actually became involved in this project because of my interest in coprolite analysis. But I just want to give you a little bit of a, a background to the, the wider archaeology of the region. So it kind of uh, tells the story of how I got involved uh, and why coprolites are so important uh, working in this area. So prehistoric archaeology in North America, I noticed uh, coming from the UK and having worked uh, largely in Europe, I was very struck that the, the focus of the archaeology here is very different. It's very much dominated by looking for the early presence of people on the continent. So a lot of emphasis on trying to find dates uh, and the earliest dates. And it's an area that's changing rapidly. Uh, even since I started working on this about five years ago, uh, the story has really changed as more sites are found uh, that kind of paint a new picture. And for most of the 20th century, this uh, hypothesis called Clovis first was the, the dominant idea uh, for how people got to the continent, continent and when they were there. And this is the, the classic model whereby people arrived over the Bering Land Bridge uh, at a time when sea levels were lower. And the earliest Clovis culture sites are dated to around 13,000 BP, so before present, and are characterized by these very distinctive uh, Clovis points. So it's just a picture of those uh, there for you, quite large tools that are often associated with mammoth bones. And this led to the, the stereotype, if you like, of the kind of big game hunter uh, going after mammoths and stabbing them with spears. And as I said, for a long time, this culture was thought to be the, the earliest people that arrived uh, in the Americas. But around 10, plus, 10 or so years ago, so kind of early 21st century, uh, a number of sites were discovered that kind of changed this idea. Uh, and these so-called pre-Clovis sites are, are now largely accepted, uh, but it's quite recent uh, that they have, have become accepted, I guess. And the site that I'm going to talk to you about, Paisley Caves, uh, was one of the earliest pre-Clovis sites that was uh, that became accepted by the wider archaeological community. Uh, and Paisley Caves is dated to about a thousand years earlier uh, than the earliest Clovis site and has a very different type of lithic technology uh, called the Western Stemmed Tradition. So despite the fact uh, that things have changed uh, quite rapidly and quite a lot, we've got lots of new pre-Clover sites that are, that are well accepted now. There's still quite a focus on trying to find the earliest sites. Uh, dating is still a major focus and trying to understand the routes by which people migrated to the continent. Uh, and really, we, we still don't know a, a huge amount about how any of these early populations interacted with their environments and adapted to changing landscapes. Now, Paisley Caves uh, is really interesting. As I said, it was one of the first pre-Clover sites that was well accepted by the archaeological community. But it is very unusual because the, the early evidence for human presence is in the form of ancient DNA that was extracted from coprolites. Uh, and these coprolites were dated uh, to 14,000 years uh, at the earliest. Now... This was very exciting. And I remember when this paper came out, it was about, um, it was in 2008, and it caused uh, quite a controversy. As I said, uh, there was a, a lot of the archaeological community that still believed in the, the so-called Clovis first hypothesis. And this is just to show you a picture of what Paisley Caves uh, looks like, or some of the sediments. And you can see we've got uh, Extensive sedimentation, a mix of aeolian, so wind-blown uh, sediments, biogenic sediments, a lot of tephra deposits in there as well. Uh, and at the base of these uh, deposits, we have really nice, well-preserved cultural material. So in association with things like uh, Pleistocene faunal remains. Uh, and it's within this layer that uh, a lot of these coprolites were found. Uh, that contained this di uh, ancient DNA that was identified as human, uh, dating to around 14,000 years before present. So when this paper came out, there was uh, quite a controversy uh, and a huge number of uh, replies to the paper, and it kind of went back and forth. Uh, and there was a number of different types of criticisms. So the first one was about the, the DNA uh, there, there was a criticism that perhaps there was contamination. This, this isn't ancient human DNA at all. It's contamination from more recent material. 
And this was largely because three of the six early coprolites had a mix of human and dog DNA in them, and that wasn't something that could be explained. There were also questions about the stratigraphic integrity of the site. Uh, so cave uh, sedimentation is very complex. Uh, and there were questions about uh, whether the materials were really associated with each other. Uh, and there was another criticism that really caught my attention at the time, uh, and that was questioning whether the coprolites were human because they didn't look human. Uh, and this is an example here of what one of these coprolites look like uh, under the microscope. So it's very kind of brown and fibrous. Uh, and one of the critiques said, well, this is what we would expect from a herbivore. It doesn't look like a human at all. It looks like something we'd see from uh, a camel, for example. Uh, and they compared it with uh, samples they'd looked at uh, from uh, Viking Age populations. Now, at the time, uh, I was working on a very different site called Chatelhuyuk in Turkey. Uh, and I was working on a, a similar question, trying to identify the species that had produced uh, coprolites that I found uh, in the middens at that site. And what I discovered was that it's really difficult to identify the species just on the ba basis of its visual characteristics. Uh, and the coprolites can look very different, uh, even within a single species. And this isn't surprising when we think about it. Uh, different foods uh, can have a very different uh, reaction in the digestive system. Uh, things like the health of an individual can play a role and also the age. There's lots of different factors uh, and visual characteristics are not at all reliable for trying to identify the species. Uh, and thinking back to the Paisley example, it's not really surprising that uh, an early human coprolite from the Great Basin would look very different to a Viking Age human from Northern Europe because they would have had very different diets and lifestyles. So that kind of uh, stuck in my mind uh, at the time. And what I was doing in Turkey was actually very different uh, to what they'd been doing at Paisley. I was using a different type of biomolecular method. So rather than DNA, uh, I was using something called uh, lipid biomarkers to identify the species. And lipids have several advantages over DNA. Uh, firstly, uh, lipid biomarkers are not soluble in water, so they're hydrophobic. Uh, and that's quite different to DNA, which actually dissolves in water. So there is potentially a problem there if you've got a cave site where you've got water coming in uh, on a periodic basis. There is potential for the, that to be actually washing DNA through the sediments. Uh, that isn't a problem that we would have with lipid biomarkers because they don't dissolve in water. So the things that we're looking at, uh, these lipid biomarkers are basically uh, types of fat molecules. So things like cholesterol that you eat in your diet actually gets converted in your digestive system uh, into things like coprostanol. So these are compounds that don't occur naturally in the soil. So they are converted by uh, bacteria uh, in the gut. Uh, into chemically very distinct types of molecules. And the method that I was using at Chatelhuyuk is something that had been developed uh, in modern pollution studies to try and identify the source of pollution uh, in, uh, in water, in rivers, for example, and try to distinguish between ag agricultural runoff from fields versus human sewage, for example. So another advantage of lipid biomarkers is that they're chemically much more stable than DNA, so let, less prone to degradation as well. Uh, another issue, obviously, that the Paisley study was originally critiqued for was this issue of DNA contamination. Uh, and again, that's something that you have to be very careful with when you're working with ancient DNA, is that we're constantly shedding uh, DNA, uh, and it's very easy to contaminate an archaeological site. Uh, with lipid biomarkers or fecal lipid biomarkers, it's very, very difficult uh, to contaminate your archaeological site uh, unless you have some very poor uh, hygiene amongst the members of your team. So I became involved um, at Paisley to try and answer this question, uh, this uncertainty around the DNA analysis. So I got in touch with Dennis Jenkins, uh, who's the guy that runs the excavations there, and I said, well, Maybe we can try and address some of these problems by using a different approach, using lipid biomarkers. So I ended up uh, applying to NERC, so the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK, uh, and we were lucky enough to be awarded the funding to uh, address some of these questions. So it's a, a kind of multi-stranded project, and I'll, I won't be able to go through all of it today, but I'm just going to take you through kind of some of the, the things that we've been doing. 
So there were two kind of broad aims to the project. One was to address this question about the timing of the earliest occupation. And the other one was to kind of look more at the people. So what were people doing with the environment uh, in terms of kind of food resources? So for the first aim, we were looking at the species analysis of the coprolites. And for the second aim, we were also wanting to look at dietary profiles from the coprolites. And I'm going to take you through uh, some of these different strands uh, in the next few slides. We are also developing a new dating method, which I won't be telling you about today because we haven't quite got the results in. Uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, COVID lockdown, uh, that aspect of the wor uh, work was put on hold for a little bit, but results from that hopefully coming soon. Uh, and also we were looking at the taphonomy of biomolecules within the cave environment as well. So this just shows you what Paisley Caves uh, looks like today. So it's actually a series of caves, uh, kind of rock shelters, that are situated uh, along an old wave-cut shoreline. So at the time that Paisley was occupied, so it's very earliest occupation, there would have been uh, an old pluvial lake that was actually uh, right up to the, um, the entrance uh, of these caves. Uh, and we know that uh, humans have actually occupied the caves intermittently, intermittently from about 14,500 uh, BP into the historic period. Uh, and at the time of the earliest occupation, the lake would have been quite close to the entrance of the cave and then has gradually receded um, in the time since then. So this is just some pictures to show you what the landscape looks like today. So it's a, a very large area, actually, that we're talking about, the Great Basin. Uh, and a lot of it uh, looks like these pictures that you see on the right there. So that's the landscape that's just outside uh, Paisley Caves today. Uh, and a lot of that landscape would have been covered by that uh, pluvial lake at the time of the earliest occupation. Today, it's very much a kind of semi-arid open landscape, a kind of steppe grassland with a lot of sagebrush, uh, juniper and things like that. But actually, not too far away, uh, at slightly higher elevations, we have quite a different landscape, uh, things like uh, coniferous trees. Uh, and the, the landscape changes very rapidly within uh, quite a short elevation. This picture on the left there just shows two pictures that were taken uh, literally just a few minutes apart, uh, showing how, how rapidly uh, things change uh, as you change um, elevation. Uh, this map here just shows you the distribution uh, of lakes uh, during the early occupation. So you can see the, the distribution of where the lakes are today. They're very much restricted uh, compared to what they would have been like uh, at the end uh, of the Pleistocene. So it's a landscape that today is quite variable and in the past would have been even more so with a, a much wetter landscape than what we see today but with a mosaic of different types of habitats. Uh, and it's a landscape that has actually cycled quite a lot between wetter, uh, warmer and drier periods. So I'm really interested in kind of how people were, were kind of interacting with their environment in this landscape and how that changed over time. So in 2017, we went to do our first season of field work. Uh, so this involves opening up the site, uh, doing a new excavation, and collecting a whole series of new samples. So we were collecting stratigraphic columns uh, and associated blocks for sediment micromorphology. And we also did a lot of mapping and photogrammetry work as well. So I'm firstly gonna take you through uh, the sediment micromorphology. So I always like to describe this as being an excavation under the microscope. So what we're doing is we're cutting blocks out of the profile, we're setting them in resin and then grinding them down into microscope slides so we can actually look at the stratigraphy under the microscope. And this is really useful when you've got sediments that are quite complicated and very finely stratified. It lets us actually look at those in more detail. Uh, and this is just one example uh, of the thin sections that I've been working through. And you can just see uh, within 15 centimetres there, um, of sediment, how variable the, the materials are. We've got very classic material at the bottom, but in the middle there, we've got something very interesting. You can see this kind of very fine brown layer that's actually been uh, slightly disturbed there. And that is quite interesting. It has some implications for our DNA analysis. Uh, and this just shows another slide with the same type of layers. Uh, and what these layers are, are actually water laid crusts of silt. So when you get water moving throughout uh, sediments, uh, the sediments become suspended in the water. Uh, when that water gradually uh, drains away, you get a very, very distinctive uh, sediment formation pattern. Uh, 
Uh, and we see these water laid lenses occurring uh, semi frequently throughout the deposits. So this is telling us uh, quite clearly that there was uh, mobility or the potential for mobility of the DNA uh, throughout these sediments. So as well as the uh, looking at the, excava the new excavations and materials that we recovered during excavation, we also wanted to interrogate the archive of material from the museum. So the museum at, at the University of Oregon has an archive of hundreds of copolites that have been collected uh, since the excavation started. Uh, and I think in the end, we ended up sampling uh, about 300 copolites. Uh, and a lot of these have been analysed already for other types of analyses. Uh, so the DNA samples, uh, for example. And one of the things that we obviously wanted to do in our project was to compare the DNA results with uh, the lipid biomarker technique. Uh, so we, we sampled the whole archive at the museum, uh, and we also went to Copenhagen, uh, which is the lab where the DNA work was originally carried out. Uh, and this is our postdoctoral researchers, uh, Helen and John, uh, in the DNA lab, uh, resampling those uh, initial set of samples that had been analysed for DNA. So I'm just going to take you through uh, the lipid biomarker work. So when we use lipid biomarkers to identify the species of coprolite, we're actually using a combination of two different uh, types of molecules. We're using something called sterols uh, and we're using something called bile acids. So they're telling us two slightly different things. So the ratio and types of sterols varies depending on your diet. So whether you're a herbivore, a carnivore or an omnivore. Bile acids, on the other hand, vary according to species. So we can further separate out things like uh, pig and human, which both have an omnivorous diet, for example. Uh, and in order to give a firm species identification, we really need to have both sets of biomarkers present. Uh, and we were very rigorous in this analysis, uh, and we didn't give a firm uh, species ID unless we had quantifiable amounts of both types of molecules present. So what happened then when we uh, took these samples that had been analysed for DNA and we looked at their lipid biomarkers? Uh, so this is the, the results of that analysis. So this chart is showing on the left there in the kind of pinks uh, and reds, the sterols from the samples. And on the right there, we have the bile acids. Uh, and for those of you who are not uh, archaeological chemists, we also have a nice, easy to understand species identification in the form of a little icon there. And just to summarise, uh, what we found was really exciting, uh, and that's that the earliest samples, or at least some of the earliest samples, were indeed human. But what we also found was that there was some disagreement with the DNA uh, in some of the samples. Uh, and this is something that we need to, to look at further, but is probably related to the, the um, basically the DNA taphonomy, uh, potentially moving uh, throughout the sediments, for example. One thing that we did find uh, that was very interesting uh, is that sample there that you can see on the left, sample 195, that has both human and dog biomarkers in it. Now, this is really important because if you remember, the criticism of the original DNA work highlighted that, well, you've got the cop copolites that have dog and human DNA in them, like what's going on there? Uh, but we also found this with the lipid biomarkers. So... Having these two lines of evidence together uh, is really important because DNA can only show the presence of a particular species, whereas our faecal biomarkers have a very precise source for where they're coming from. Uh, and the only possible explanation for a mix of faecal biomarkers from a dog and from a human in a single sample is coprophagy. Uh, and I'll leave you to work out what that means, but it's behaviour that's well known uh, amongst dogs and some other animals as well. Uh, and the fact that we've got this uh, coprophagy behaviour occurring uh, at the Paisley Cave site is actually really nice indirect evidence uh, of humans and dogs coexisting alongside each other and possibly, uh, probably even uh, being domesticated. We actually know that dog domestication occurred um, a lot earlier than uh, the Paisley Cave dates, actually. So that's the, the results of the species analysis then. So we, we have this great method for being able to identify whether we have human or other types of coprolites. Uh, but what we now want to do is kind of take that further and think more about, well, what were these people doing uh, in this landscape that was changing very rapidly from the, the kind of end of the, the Pleistocene into the early Holocene? So obviously identifying species is, the, is important and it's the first step, 
But what we also want to do is kind of to, to be able to ask all of these interesting questions as well. Uh, and our team developed a protocol for not just identifying the species of coprolite, but for conducting what we call a multi-proxy analysis of the coprolites to identify what people were eating. Uh, and this is a, also what we like to call a kind of multi-scalar analysis. So we start by looking at the, the macro scale, at the morphology, the microscopic contents, and also bringing in molecular dietary information as well. So this is quite a complicated thing to do. So you have a single sample where you're conducting all of these different types of analyses. So you end up with lots of different types of data that are kind of working in different ways. So this is analysis that is still ongoing. But uh, just this week, actually, we've uh, published a, a second paper where we're kind of testing this multi-proxy dietary analysis. Uh, and we started by looking at a small subset of nine samples, looking at some of the early material and some of the later material to try and kind of test how we bring these different methods together. So those nine coprolites then that we looked at uh, kind of... Uh, listed there in order of age with the, the oldest there at the bottom. Uh, and what we found, uh, lots of really interesting things, actually. So we have plant fiber present in all of the samples, but in very different proportions. Uh, a very large diversity of plant species present uh, and a high variability between the coprolites as well. So a lot of the times when people look at coprolites, so from a single site, you normally expect the, the diets to be relatively similar uh, amongst the, the different coprolites that you look at. Uh, Paisley Caves doesn't seem to be like that at all. We seem to have quite a lot of variability uh, in the types of plant species that we're seeing uh, between the different coprolites. Uh, some examples there of the types of things that we're finding. Uh, so this very distinctive plant, the cattail or bulrush, uh, that's seen both in the presence of seeds uh, and also the pollen as well. Uh, and here is that pollen diagram, again, showing a kind of similar picture to the plant macrofossils. We've got quite a diversity in the range of species that are present uh, and potentially some difference between the, the earlier samples uh, and the later samples as well. But we can't really say that for certain until we look at a, a wider range of samples. Here is a, an example of the animal bone data. So again, quite a large variability uh, in the amount of bone present in the samples. So again, similar to the plant, everything has uh, some bone in it, but very variable in the, the amount of bone uh, that we have. Things like um, hare or jackrabbit, for example, different types of fish uh, and a bird uh, as well. We have uh, one example that's really interesting where we've got rodent bones, uh, the vertebra uh, and the phalanges and also the little claws as well. Uh, and this coprolite also has a, a large amount of animal hair in it. So this is really nice evidence for the consumption basically of whole rodents. Uh, and this is something that's actually known uh, ethnographically from the Great Basin region, uh, but has never been identified uh, in these really early samples before. So really nice uh, example uh, of the types of opportunistic uh, foraging and things that people would have been doing uh, at that time. Something else that's really exciting, uh, we found a lot of insect remains in the coprolites. So again, most of the samples had insects in them. Uh, I think two, two samples didn't, but everything else uh, had a certain number of insect remains in it. Uh, these are, again, just some examples of the types of species that we're finding. So... Uh, June beetles, uh, darkling beetles, is that one in the middle there? And then uh, Jerusalem crickets, uh, those things there on the right, quite uh, quite large, uh, ugly looking things, actually. Um, but really, again, quite fascinating. So it's something I think that we think are a bit kind of like, oh, that's a bit of a, a gross thing to do. But obviously, uh, quite easy to catch and to kind of just eat as a snack. Uh, and obviously, um, that's what people were doing uh, at this time. Uh, work that's still in progress is the dietary biomarkers. So as well as the contents, uh, we're also looking at the, the chemical residue uh, of diet as well. So things like bones uh, and seeds that we find in coprolites is obviously the material that has survived digestion. But we also want to know about the stuff that was fully digested. And that's where the biomarkers come in. So the things that we're looking at are quite similar to the sterols uh, that we look like to identify the species. So if you remember, I said that we can actually uh, 
use the sterols to say whether something has a herbivorous or a carnivorous diet, for example. Uh, and that's because uh, plants have a different type of sterols to animals. Uh, so again, just a, a snippet of some of the data that we've got. We have uh, samples that have a uh, high abundance of plant stanols in them. We have a different type uh, of plant residue. So we have things called triterpenoids. Uh, so kind of like waxy uh, types of plants as well. Uh, and we also have alkanes from insects. So again, really nice uh, complementary evidence for what we're finding uh, from the macrofossils. The interesting thing is that there isn't necessarily a correlation between samples that have uh, visible insect remains and those that have chemical signals from insects. And again, this is uh, due to the quite complex nature of the digestive, digestive process and the taphonomy uh, of coprolite analysis. So again, by using these different types of methods, we're, we're trying to provide a kind of fuller, more rounded picture uh, of diet. And this is especially important in cases when you've got a differential preservation of things like pollen. So there are some of the older samples that have quite poor pollen preservation, but hopefully we can still get dietary information by looking at the chemical residues. So as I said, this, was a, this is an initial test set of nine samples. And just to summarise, all nine of the coprolites that we looked at in this initial sample set have a mix of uh, plant and animal remains uh, in varying proportions. We've got a huge variety in, in the types of species and things that are present uh, and uh, differences between the individual coprolites. And this is just a, a kind of way that we're trying to present this data. So the, the difficulty is how to bring all of these different strands together. So the seeds, the bones, the pollen, the chemical residues uh, to provide a kind of a story, if you like, about what people were eating uh, as a meal uh, and how that changed over time. So this is our attempt to trying to look at a, a seasonal model uh, of diet. So by, by looking at things in combination, we can say, well, these seeds are only produced at this time of the year. This bird's a migratory species that would only be present at this time of the year. We can actually begin to say uh, broadly when people would have been present within the landscape. So the majority of the samples that we looked at here had a signal that was related to a kind of late summer, early autumn occupation. But we did have two samples that were a little bit different. We had uh, one sample 195 there that had more of a kind of late spring, early summer signal. And then another one that was a bit more variable, a kind of autumn, early winter signal. So we can't say too much at this point because it's only nine samples. But once we finish collating the data from the whole sample set, so the, the archive of uh, the few hundred samples that we have, what we're hoping to do is to do this kind of more rigorously and actually look at how diet changed over time uh, from the Younger Dryas uh, into the late Pleistocene and early Holocene uh, and begin to look at things like the seasonality of landscape use uh, and how that changed. So what next then? So as I said, then we are hoping to finish the, well, we have finished the analysis actually of the, the full coprolite archive. And it's just a case of working through the data at the moment. But what we also want to do is to integrate the data from the coprolites with other types of evidence as well. So coprolites are great because they can tell us about all sorts of things that aren't present in the, the rest of the archaeological record. But obviously, they're also missing uh, certain things as well. So things like uh, larger mammal consumption, for example, basically things that wouldn't have been consumed. So you wouldn't expect people to be uh, probably be eating kind of the larger bones from things like this pronghorn, for example. But we do know that people were hunting and eating these larger species because we have some nice zooarchaeological evidence uh, for these types of bones with cut marks on them, for example. So what we want to do eventually is to, to kind of bring all of this data together uh, and think more broadly about, about diet and about resource use. And also interrogate this question that is uh, quite popular, I guess, in early prehistory in the Americas about kind of high ranked versus low ranked food sources. So again, it's quite a different approach, I think, to, to how we look at food and diet uh, in the UK and in European archaeology. Uh, there's a very functional uh, approach, I think, in the Americas uh, and this kind of focus on calories uh, and things like that. And what we want to do is to kind of take it beyond that a little bit. And I think the the data that we have so far actually shows that uh, 
the kind of calorie content was not necessarily the main uh, consideration when people were kind of choosing what foods they were eating. And there's a lot more kind of local foraging, uh, maybe even opportunistic consumption of the things like the insects, for example. And again, kind of in, uh, integrating this a little bit with a lot of the ethnographic data from this region as well. So that is it for me uh, for this seminar. And obviously, I'd just like to thank uh, the whole of the team. Uh, this is very much uh, an, a collaborative project uh, with the whole team. And the data that I presented you, to you today has been generated by lots of different uh, team members. So thank you to all of them uh, and to our excavation team. And thank you to, for you for listening. And I will be available if you have any questions.